testing hello testing hello hello microphone testing hello one two three Hello testing. Hello testing. Hello. Hello microphone testing. Hello testing. Hello. Hello testing. Hello testing. Hello. Hello testing. Hello. Hello testing. Hello one two three. Hello testing. Hello testing. Hello. Hello.
Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Besant Lecture. Um, we are very fortunate to have with us this evening Professor Lokesh Chandra. He has come from Delhi, uh, and actually, with the delays in his flight, he just barely made it. So we're very, very fortunate to have him. <laughs> uh, about two years, well, it's two years ago now, in 2016, uh, was my first chance to meet Professor Chandra in Delhi uh, when the Indian Council of Cultural Relations, the ICCR, uh, had invited me to present a brief talk in, uh, in Delhi. Uh, that part was a nice experience for me, but the real beauty of the experience for me was to have the opportunity to sit and to talk and to listen to Professor Chandra that evening. Uh, he's a remarkable man in terms of his scholarship. Uh, and just to tell you just a little bit about him, uh, Professor, he's a prominent scholar of Vedic period and Buddhism and the Indian arts, all of those fields. Presently, he is the president of the ICCR. Uh, he is also the director of the International Academy of Indian Culture. He has served as a member of the Indian Rajva Sabha. He has been vice president of the Indian Council of Cultural Relations and chairman of the Indian Council on Historical Research. Uh, he is, in 2006, he was recognized with one of India's highest civilian awards, the Padma Bhusan Award. Very, very few people are able to say that. He's the son of a famous Sanskrit scholar, a linguist, and a politician, Raghu Vira. And in talking with Professor Chandra in Delhi a couple of years ago, I became aware that many of the words that have made their way into the language came by the avenue of his father's research and his father's work. So he has been influential in that way. After obtaining his master's degree at the University of Punjab in Lahore in 1947, he edited the Gavamayayana portion of the Vedic work Jaminiya Brahmana with the help of newly discovered manuscripts. Professor Chandra went to the Netherlands to study Old Javanese with the Indologist Jan Gonda at Utrecht University, where he obtained a PhD and in March of 1950. Professor Chandra has studied many languages, including English, Hindi, Sanskrit, Bengali, Pali, Avesta, Old Persian, Japanese, Chinese, Tibetan, I'm not through, Malayalam, Mongolian, Indonesian, Greek, Latin, German, French, Tamil, Old Javanese, and Russian. And perhaps there are one or two others. But remarkable, uh, and all of those have been applied to his research. He has to his credit over 360 separate works, and actually I think the number is much higher than that, and text editions. Among them are classics such as his Tibetan Sanskrit Dictionary, materials for a history of Tibetan literature, Buddhist iconography of Tibet, and his Dictionary of Buddhist Art, which covers more than 20 volumes. So we're very, very fortunate to have him here this evening to share with us some of his thoughts. And it will be on the subject of Tamil, the glory of India. So I will turn it over to Professor Chandra. Mr. President and friends, I come here to pay homage to this great Theosophical Society. Three major events of the 20th century which have conditioned our freedom struggle, subsequent evolution as a nation, were born in this place. David Hume created the Indian National Congress, which governed India for a thousand years, sometimes in mines, sometimes in governments. <coughs> Annie Besant, she for the first time spoke of cultural nationalism. 
She did many things in India which have been extremely useful for us. And the present government is the great, great grandson of what Mrs. Annie Besant did. If you read the Indian constitution, the very preamble is a condition by the Irish constitution. We, the people of India, give unto ourselves this constitution and so on. A phrase which is borrowed from the Irish constitution. People in the middle of the 20th century who were fighting for a national language, Hindi, they used to read how Irish was to become the language of Ireland. Ireland was very much a part of our thinking of the independence movement. There are several sections in the Indian constitution which depend on the Irish constitution. And some, my father who used to translate the English constitution into Hindi and other Indian languages, he sometimes saw the Irish wording because the Irish wording had a nuance of its own a depth of its own, it had a sensitivity which could not be conveyed in the English translation. So, <clears throat> Annie Besant became a great figure for us. And the present government, uh, the whole idea of uh, Alcott and Madame Blavatsky, that has also conditioned India to a very great extent. First, I would like to say a few words about Madame Blavatsky. I was in the Soviet Union seven times. Once I went to see the Buryats, there the, the Russians met about 400 years ago, the Mongols. The, they asked many questions with, to the Mongols. First was, where is your Bible? They showed them a collection of Prajna Paramita texts written in golden ink on blue paper. The paper was made of, birch, uh, of bark of a tree and cloth, very old cloth. It was that high. The Russians were thrilled to see that they have such a big Bible. They saw the Buryats living, beautiful icons, statues, beautiful Thanka paintings, and the thought content the philosophic discussion that moved the Russians who were exiled there for their religious beliefs. And these Buryats, they never distinguished against them. They said, well, you, you have your own way of re religious uh, ritual. We have our own way. So the, they were very much impressed. And they used to talk that from where does this religion, Lamaism of the Buryat come? It comes from Tibet. And from where did it go to Tibet? It went to Tibet from India. And that is how Madame Blavatsky was thrilled by the idea of the Tibetan, the first office of the Theosophical Society that they created in New York was called the Lamasari because there are too many Russian Tibetan objects. And even as late as uh, President Brezhnev, President Brezhnev was lying very ill. The, the, the modern allopathic medicine could not treat him. He, I don't know how, I had a, the Russian ambassador was a great friend of mine, Kadakin. He loved the Tibetans. So perhaps he arranged it. So the Dalai, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama sent a medicine for Brezhnev. And Brezhnev started to improve. And that was the beginning of traditional medicine in, in the yet Soviet Union. So you know the whole Russian ambience of respect for the Buryats, for their freedom, for their excellent, beautiful homes. And I visited these homes and also the homes of the Russian exiles to see the contrast. And the uh, uh, Buryat homes, they were, had beautiful carpets, not only on the floor, on the walls also. How to keep the rooms warm when the temperature is minus 50. You really have to see what minus 50 is. I went in December to see what minus 50 in Buryatia is. Just to a feel of how history emerges. So you know, Madame Blavatsky's uh, experience of the whole Tibetan situation <clears throat> well, has again to be you know, understood very well. And then, <clears throat> 
still all caught. When he came to India, the first thing he did was to touch the earth of India as what he called my instinctive act of puja. That was the beginning of our cultural nationalism. In India, we had a problem. The, the, the Arya Samaj started the resurrection of the cultural ambience of India. Many others did it. <coughs> Paramhans, Ram Krishna tried it. But the English educated society could not be given an idea of rich, what rich heritage they have. Uh, Alcott, for the first time, you know, they spoke to the Indian, first an American, secondly he spoke in English. So the whole idea of an Indian culture became very much a part of the Anglicized or English speaking or English learning society of India. I think it was also a very important contribution of the Theosophical Society. So for me there are four contributions of the philosophical, Theosophical Society, the Kong Indian National Congress, the Annie Besant Cultural Nationalism, then this whole idea of the teaching the anglicized English learning class of Indians, what is their culture. And out of this emerged the great Vivekananda. <coughs> Vivekananda was actually a product of what was being done by Olcott and his friend. So the, I have a great respect for the Theosophical Society that what it did for the 20th century perhaps, perhaps has never been highlighted. It deserves to be highlighted. How small men, but dedicated men. Dedication is important. It's not the grandeur, the position you hold, but the dedication with which you command your ideals. So that was a very uh, great contribution of the Theosophical Society. And I think it should be celebrated on a national level. The 150 years of the Theosophical Society should have been a national celebration because many of these political perceptions, many of the cultural perceptions, they have emerged from this place. You know, and now I come to Tamil. I was a young student when I went to the West, to Europe. I had a Jewish friend. I, I am a very strict vegetarian. So I took him one day and said, I want to see everything. What is meat? And I had never seen meat. Even today I can't see meat. It doesn't, you know, somehow repels me. I don't say don't eat meat. But I say it, do, it doesn't suit me. Even the sight doesn't suit me. So he went with me all around and showed me for two days what is meat. Then I asked him what is vegetarian in Europe to eat. That also he showed me. And suddenly, you know, one day when we were walking in the vegetarian places, he said, on Friday, which is a holy day of the Jews, we don't eat meat. We eat vegetarian food. And we don't cook this vegetarian food in utensils in which meat has been cooked. We use special utensils to cook vegetarian food on the holy day of Friday. And to this day, wherever I go, I find it very difficult to eat in a restaurant or a hotel. I find must have been cooked in a utensil in which meat has been cooked. So with great reluctance, I take food outside. And here also I have brought, brought my food with me. So you can imagine. And you know, suddenly I asked him, that he, then he suddenly said, you know, this eat idea of not eating meat may have come from India. I said, I don't, I don't know. I have never worked on this. He said, I said, how do you think so? He said, in the Old Testament, it is said that from the Indian seaport of Ophur, they used to get gold. Number two, they used to get sandalwood. They used to get perfumes. They used to get beautiful fabrics because we were the only nation which made see-through fabrics. And you know, the women looked so fascinating that the Roman emperors had to 
tell the Indian that no more Indian fabric should come to Rome because it spoils the moral of the Roman people. So, you know, uh, and then this passage is a very interesting passage. A number of things are mentioned. Now, what is Ophir has been discussed for the last at least 200 years since uh, the West started Oriental studies. And Ophir is, uh, according to me, people have not been able to identify the port from which these things went. Among these objects, there is one very interesting word, the word for peacock. The um, people of Jerusalem didn't have a peacock. The, these things were going to Jerusalem. And King Solomon wanted to create a capital which was, not to, which was to surpass every other capital in that region. And Jerus he created a Jerusalem with gold, with uh, sandalwood trees and so on, with sandalwood and so on. So in this, and he had peacocks. The word for peacock is a Tamil word. And I think the other words also which defy interpretation in Hebrew terms should be looked again by a great scholar of Tabil. Not who understands only modern Tabil, but who understands the history, the linguistic history of Tabil. So this, this word for peacock revealed the secret that it was the Tamil people who used to go there bring gold. You know, it's very interesting that gold mines in India, have, we have found gold mines of the first century BC. And the same system of mining, the shaft, same, same shafting is found in Africa, where the Tamils used to dig gold. And what may, you know, the system is the shafting, the whole system of mining is the same. But the most important point is that they have found tamarind there, tamarind seeds. Tamarind doesn't exist in Africa. So that clinches the whole issue that these gold mines were being operated by the Tamils. And that is why they used to supply gold to Jerusalem. And Jer Jerusalem became the shining city of West Asia. And till this day, you know, it's in the news today. It became the mm, very, I think, the most sacred spot of three religions of the world, three major religions of the world a tribute to Solomon and also a tribute to the great Tamil people who brought all this glory, the gold, the sandalwood, the fabrics, and the peacocks. What does a peacock signify? In India, peacock is the vehicle of Kartikeya. Kartikeya is general of the gods. So if you want your state to be blessed, by total security, you worship Kartikeya Murugan. So the worship of Kartikeya in Jerusalem was to see that the city is perfectly protected. Nobody can attack it. So the peacocks were going there all the time. And the peacocks were being exported from India to kings all over West Asia just for the reason that it will provide them security from attack. <clears throat> now the question of Ophir. You know, it's very interesting. Most of the scholarship that is being done today, it is done on the basis of the authorized version. There are many versions, more ancient versions, and they have sometimes very interesting reading. When I was there and my friend told me that we must have got vegetarianism on Friday from India, Today I feel what he said must be right. I have no proof but must be right because in those regions there is no vegetarianism. But now at the Ophir, I said, you know, to my friend, let us go to the library and see a variorum edition. What is a variorum edition? A variorum edition is one in which the different readings of the same word are given. So in the more ancient manuscripts, the reading is not Ophir, it is Sophir. Now what is Sophir? Sophir is Sopara. A, a very important seaport on the east coast. And now, it, you know, for, for the whole th picture falls into a coherence. Gold mines from Africa, gold mines from South India. 
all the Tamil merchants, you know, taking this gold from the seaport of Sophir, not Ophir, Sophir. So all these words which are mentioned, which were being imported into Jerusalem, they, we have to see what are the readings in the ancient manuscripts because they are, cannot be explained in Hebrew terms. So they have, maybe they are Tamil words. And in the original Tamil, um, ancient, I'm not speaking of modern Tamil, I'm speaking of very ancient Tamil. First, 1000 BC, not even two or 300 BC, 1000 BC. So the Tamils for the first time uh, uh, went abroad. That is the first literary reference to the presence of India abroad. In, the, in Tamil there is a saying, well I don't remember the Tamil, that one should cross the oceans to earn money. And Shilapadi Karan, the classic of the Tangam period, it was a very beautiful statement, which has never been interpreted, that in every capital of the Tamil land, there was a temple to the moon. Why a temple to the moon? You know, I try to seal history myself, not just to read, but also to feel. In 1956 and 57, the Suez Canal was closed. So we took the boat to see how the historic route of, uh, you know, around the Cape of Good Hope and we went up to Naples. An experience, you know, which will never be repeated. Perhaps the boats don't ply anymore. And when it is a full moon, the boat is in the big ship is in such a condition that you have to put back all your books, every all your utensils into a bag and tie it up. Otherwise they might hurt you. Everything is flying. For three to four days you have this experience during the full moon. When it is half moon, when it is a crescent, the sea is placid and calm. It just, you know, you feel so happy after that great turbulence, that turbulence and peace, they go together. They are brothers and sisters. They are not opponents. Hmm? So, what do you do? Now, uh, this moon, Lord Shiva, Somanath, the famous temple of Somanath. Somanath is that Shiva who has a crescent in his head. A very special form of Shiva to see that the sea, trans-oceanic trade is not disturbed by the waves. So they prayed to Shiva. Somanath was a temple where every trader, whether Roman, whether Arab, or whether Indian, they paid tribute. One of the richest temples on in the eastern shoreline of India. And that is why it was attacked. So, uh, and Somanath, even Elephanta, Shiva has a crescent. And the Tamils, they, for the first time, went out to Southeast Asia. What did they do? <coughs> the first thing they, <coughs> uh, they did was to f establish a government in Champa, the coastline of modern Vietnam. This dynasty was called the Mara dynasty. The Mara dynasty was actually ruling at that time in Madurai. So it was a Tamil dynasty. <coughs> so <coughs> this, uh, <coughs> you know, the whole and the whole coast of uh, uh, Vietnam or ancient Champa is studied with temples of Shiva. Uh, during the bombing by the Americans at Mison, when Ho Chi Minh was fighting against the French. And the, uh, and the Americans were taking part. They have bombarded most of these temples because they were on the coastline. And the uh, so fighters of uh, Vochi Min, they used to hide in these temples, believing that they won't be attacked, but they still the Americans bombarded. So very few of these temples stand today. Only their foundations can be seen. But one thing is very clear that throughout the coastal line, the Tamils, created Shiva with a crescent to bless trans-oceanic trade. That is why the Shilapadi Karam says that in every capital of the Tamil land, there was a temple to the moon. That means that the Tamils were going across the oceans very frequently.
you know, <coughs> uh, in in the, the Tamils had very close connection with Rome. Indira Gandhi had a very beautiful social secretary. She was supposed to be Indian, but she looked very Western. I have forgotten her name. But I asked her one day that you look so Western. How is it that you look so Western? She said, I come from a place in South India where there was a temple to Emperor, the Roman Emperor Augustus. The priestesses in that temple were not Indian. They came from Rome. So we are descendants of those Roman priestesses. Musiris is the Latin name. I think Muchilin or Muchilin, something like that in Tamil, uh, in that uh, area. You see, uh, and then the in the South Indian kings sent a special delegation to Rome to attend the coronation of Emperor Augustus. And you know Augustus, what does it mean? It means Ojishta, the mightiest king. <coughs> India, you know, was very famous for three things. India was a land of agriculture. Our agriculture goes back to about 6000 BC. The European agriculture goes back to about 3500 BC. The histor historians of agriculture say that agriculture to the west that went from the Hittites to Europe. The Hittites were a people who worshipped the Vedic gods. They have inscri left inscriptions in which they invoked the Vedic gods in their treaties. <coughs> so they, what did we do in agriculture? We created cotton. And Pliny in his natural history says that Indians grow their clothes on trees. They of course don't grow their clothes on trees, but definitely cotton is a production, of, I mean, it has special, it's a botanical production. We, for the first time, created vegetable oil. We, for the first time, created uh, sugar, sugar from the plants. Earlier, sugar was derived from honey. So how could honey be that abundant? And sugar had gone, went from India to the whole of the West. And the Ikshvaku family became important. Ikshu in Sanskrit means the sugar cane. Ishwaku means the family of the sugar cane because they were extremely rich because of the export of sugar. So sh we gave sugar to the West. We gave them cotton fabrics and we gave them vegetable oil which became olive oil in their country. Why? When the ladies, you know, gave off their clothes, uh, I mean uh, leather clothes, and took on the cotton fabrics, they looked more charming, didn't smell, cotton smell, I know the uh, leather smells at times, particularly in those days when tanning was not that of, that high, of that high order. And then they started cooking in oil, but even today in the West, cooking is done mostly in love. Oil cooking is very rare. Even in Delhi, in the big hotels, they cook in love, they don't cook in oil following the Western pattern. So, you know, um, this great, and now what did the Romans do? They, when they, these Tamil merchants were sending all their ambassadors, their cotton fabrics to Rome. The Roman ladies, you know, dressed in those flimsy see-through clothes. The Roman emperor had to t pay for those clothes what the British calculated as half a million pounds every year. But of course, in half a million of that period has been in billions and trillions of today. So the Roman emperor forbade that no woman would wear an Indian fabric. No money will go to India. So what to do? The Tamils, you know, had no gold left. The gold that flowed from Rome stopped. And if you see the excavations the Arika may do, they have found a lot of Roman coins. The Roman coins were found in bagfuls. I don't know what happened to those Roman coins. Everything didn't come to the museum. We have Greek uh, Roman amphora because wine used to come from Rome. <coughs> so what did they do? 
the Tamils went in search of the golden land, the Suvarna Bhumi. Where did you find that Suvarna Bhumi? Is the question. I was a young student in the West, and you know, started studying old Javanese. Old Javanese was, is very interesting even to this day. My professor the, said that uh, the first inscription uh, which mentions in, uh, in, is in Sanskrit of Purnavarman. That inscription has a word Taruma. Taruma is the name of the capital of the king of King Purnavarman. Trying to find out the etymology of Taruma. Couldn't find an etymology in old Javanese, couldn't find an etymology in Sanskrit. I said, Professor, it's a Tamil word, Dharuma. Dharuma means Dharma. The city of Dharma. He wouldn't agree. He said, What proof? I said, Go to Tamil Nadu, wherever you see Dharuma, Dharma, you have this word, Dharuma is written there. Hmm? I think till the very end of his life, he did not believe. And you know, in, in <laughs> the whole idea of uh, then I told my professor the inscription is in the Pallava script. It's a South Indian script. The Pallava kings were rulers of Kanchi. Didn't accept. He accepted they were rulers. But Taruma's etymology, no. I said no. It's hundred percent Tamil. Hmm? So till the very end, I think we differed on this question. <coughs> Then, uh, you know, the shore temple at Mamallapuram. Very fascinating temple. In B Indonesia, the people have written about the Ma Mamallapuram temple in a number of books. But they have not written one thing. That in Bali, there is a big, huge legend about Mahab King Mahabali who came from India to Bali. Now, what is the relation of King Mahamallapuram? And Mahabali has never been investigated. It should be investigated. Why? Because, you know, when the Roman gold ceased to flow to the south, they had to find the Subhanna Bhuti. Now, in marine archaeology, in Bali, they have found Kharoshti inscriptions of the first century, marine archaeology, first century AD, the earliest, Earlier 400 was the beginning, but now it is the first or AD or BC is the beginning of the contacts of the south with Indonesia. Hmm? And um, this contact, you know, <coughs> can be seen in many, many places. For example, Borobudur. There was a very imp big, important professor, Kasparis, a Dutch professor who taught at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, taught in many American universities, a great friend of mine. But we were always quarreling. And you know, he said, you are a Hindi speaker, why do you fight for Tamil? I said, for me, Hindi and Tamil are my languages. They are Indian. So what did he say? Bora Budur. He said, Pudur is Sanskrit Bhudhar, mountain. I said, no. Pudur is the Tamil word Pudur, the new city, the new town. Why do I say so? It is located in a village called Bhumi Sagara, Sagoro in Javanese pronunciation, Bhumi Sagara, the village of the people from beyond the oceans. I said refers to the Tamils. Then <clears throat> it is uh, called Bhumi Sambhara. In the Tamil lexicon, Sambhara is a colony of Buddhists. So Bhumi Sambhara means the village of Tamil Buddhists. So I said, the name of the village supports my contention. The name of the, uh, in the inscription, which calls it not Bhumi Sagara, but calls it Bhumi Sambhara. Both Tamil words in a Tamil meaning. Then there is the word Kamulan. Kamulan actually is Mulasthana. I looked up the Tamil lexicon and Mulasthana means the temple in Tamil. So I says it's a Tamil usage. Kamulan doesn't mean the origin of the dynasty of the Shailendras. It is a Tamil word which means the temple. And there are many other expressions in that. 
there is a small inscription found tiru ranu he want he said he is a th- name of an official i said no tiru is mr or shri not actually mr but shri is a prefix to the names of royal personages so i won't say mr but let's say his highness and ranu ranu ma is an army the king ruling that area is called sangram tunga so i said is the tamil name of the king who was ruling this area what does it actually mean that the borobudur is also due to the great tamil people both the tamil traders and a tamil king whose sanskrit name was sangram tunga and whose tamil name was tiruranu perhaps a nick name domestic name of his so you know and then in in you know in inscription the inscription begins with shani gives the date and in that date shani var is not written with a sha but with a cha tamil doesn't have a sha it has a cha so that also is a tamil expression so that great monument to the borobudur you know is of course if not completely tamil at least it origins go back to the tamils and a beautiful inscription which i don't want to relate at length but <clears throat> the whole idea is that the tamils have been one of the most dynamic people living near the ocean celebrating the ocean our trans oceanic voyages are celebrated only in two languages one is tamil that cross the oceans and the other is gujarati where they speak of the voyages to java that how plenty could be gained by a voyage to java <coughs> in indonesia there is the temple of prambanan prambanan has 240 parivar temples there is no tradition except in the south of creating parivar temples brihadeshwara i think has 24 parivar temples i don't recollect now but it has 240 parivar temples again is south indian idea that there should be parivar temples to the main temple so wherever you look around you have the tamil present they have a goddess called lara kidul lara kidul mean dakshineshwari the goddess of the south if you go to cambodia they still <coughs> celebrate mm money what is her name mani mani karan i let i'll speak about it later on uh, now in indonesia in java there is still are some hindus and buddhists they celebrate their new year's day by a bull fight bull fight again is a very special part of the tamil culture hmm and uh, what is it called uh, jilli uh, kattu hmm so i know how things live hmm? so wherever you watch and wherever we do not find an explanation i have to go back to my tamil lexicon or to my books on tamil nadu and maybe i may find an answer and many times i do succeed hmm? <coughs> question of tibet <coughs> you know it's very interesting that tibet got buddhism during the, uh, the train of sunseng gampo but he did not find a firm footing because there was the other religion born to find a firm footing there was a scholar from the south kamala shila who was brought by the tibetan king and padma samba also went there so who was padma samba the westerners say that he came from udyana that is uh, in the northwest Uh, what is now called uh, swat so but the, the word in tibet tibet in tibetan is not udyan udyanam udyanam is the kanchi it, is a, it refers to the city of kanchi the last uh, year i was working on from where did padma sambhava go and i have found sri lankan inscriptions in, in which it is clearly said that he went from sri parvata to tibet he is the patron saint of bhutan 
Tamil Nadu should actually invite the king of Bhutan sometime and say that we have given you your patron saint. We want to celebrate his presence in the, Kisi, in the land of Bhutan conjointly. So, <coughs> Tara Natha's history of Buddhism in India. He gives the genealogies only of the kings of Kanchi. So far, nobody has worked on that chronology. It's very important. The role Tamil Nadu played in the Indianization of Tibet, or Buddhization of Tibet. It was the eastern coast. So from Tamil Nadu, you go to Andhra Pradesh, you go up to Odisha, go up to Bengal, Assam, and then you are in Tibet. So the eastern coast was a very important part, and particularly because of the oceans. <coughs> You see, the, if you, one of the greatest Tamils, I think, who has ever lived is Bodhi Dharma, the greatest. Wherever you go in China, you find a Zen or Chan monastery. Bodhi Dharma went to China and made Zen, Dhyana Buddhism, the dominant expression of Chinese religion, the dominant. He gave three things. First is he gave the Lankavatara Sutra as the basic text. Lankavatara is defined by Hui Li, the biographer of Yun Sang's life, as the city of Kanchi, as a transit to a seaport to Sri Lanka, three days journey. So we know for sure Lankavatara is Kanchi, number one. The second thing he gave was the Prajna Paramita Hridaya Sutra, the Heart Sutra. The third, he gave the hymn of the Nilakantha Lokeshwara, Shiva. But in China, he was converted into a Buddhist deity and called the Thousand Arm Dabalokiteshwara. What happens? When the Chinese celebrated the International Olympics in 2008, they began with a Sanskrit hymn of this Nilakantha Lokeshwara who was taken by Bodhi Dharma to China, Bodhi Dharma Tamil. He was the fourth prince of the king of Kanchi, fourth prince. He had, he, of course, he couldn't be, get any place in the governance, so he must have gone to China to find a new fortune. And what he gave, he gave this hymn. It was sung by 1,000 girls of the nearly the same height. And you... You can still see a CD of that, beautiful. The way they sang that Sanskrit hymn and the way they celebrated that hymn of Bodhi Dharma. To me, it is the glory of Tamil Nadu. Hmm? I have a recording of that, beautiful recording, played not in Indian tune, not in Carnatic music, played with modern martial music. You should hear how Sanskrit sounds in the European martial tune, and in Chinese voices. Fabulous. Hmm? It's an experience to hear that. Hmm? I should actually have brought that, but I forgot. Hmm? <clears throat> you see, the Bodhi Dharma, there were many. There was one Prajna in China. He came from Kapisha in Afghanistan. Came to Kanchi to learn Tamil. Why? Because the dharanis in Buddhism have Tamil words. There are three higher stages of Ashtanga Yoga, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. Dharana is represented in Chinese by Tholoni. Dhyana is represented by its Pali transformation, Chan or Zen in Japanese. And samadhi is represented by Sanmei. Bodhi Dharma introduced three Sanskrit words. They were not translated. To this day, they are part of the Zen repertoire in China. Hmm? And China has at least 20 or 30,000 Zen temples. If you erect a temple to Bodhi Dharma, you will get so many pilgrims from China, from Korea and Japan. It can be a major tourist attraction. Hmm? There's, there's the <coughs> now, 
this bodhi dharma what uh, no this uh, prajna what did he do he learned tamil he, uh, he uh, tamil the other thing he learned chinese in kanchi chinese was such an important trading port that the ch- he could learn chinese here went back to Ch- uh, he prajna went to china to translate sanskrit texts now what to translate the king of kanchi sent his own cap- uh, copy of the gandha yuga sutra he translated that but i think the most important contribution of prajna was creation of the japanese alphabet it follows the tamil sequence begin a e u a o ka ki ku ke ko sa shi su se so there is no nga in japanese tamil has ka and nga cha and nya in japanese there is no nga there is no nya so they don't exist so ka cha becomes sa in japanese ta but na is the word which occurs in the beginning of words so na is the ta and na pa and ma yara wa hmm? the japanese sequence, the alphabet follows the tamil sequence you know it was always a question that why uh, does what is the see from where does Ch- japanese derive its sequence which letters are missing and why at the end there is the final n what the japanese call oni is also the tamil expression so you know the, if you see every ch- japanese child learns this alphabet again something given by the tamils what i feel is that the tamils you know should actually celebrate what they have given to the world they have given lots of things instead of hatred instead of self fighting in fighting i don't clip, uh, you know mm. oppose anyone well part of human life but at the same time they should also celebrate their greatness what they have given to this world mm. in japan <clears throat> bodhi dharma is called daruma again tamil word dharma is written as daruma hmm? now the question is did bodhi dharma go to japan or not in china he is called thamo dhamma but in japan he is called daruma the tamil word hmm? very interesting how this word originates so far no japanese has been able to tell me they have been trying to make a beautiful temple of bodhi dharma here in kanchi but so far they have not succeeded in doing it i hope some day they will be able to do it another thing today the japanese uh, royal reper- imperial repertoire of dances it got um, in the 8th century the japanese emperor shomu made a big image of the buddha called the nara daibutsu about 60 feet high and they wanted to consecrate it so they got one <coughs> buddha sthira buddha sthira was a tamilya what did he do he took eight dances from champa what is the coastline of vietnam today to japan though out of those eight dances three dances still survive and one of them is the rigvedic dance of king pedu the only rigvedic dance that lives hmm? so the tamils you know they had their classics of course everyone has you know the spoken language but there's only classical language so they for the first time have left in japan this dance of pedu still being performed in the imperial palace on very special days and this buddha sthira he taught sanskrit to the japanese for the first time i went to see this monastery the place where buddha sthira used to teach tam uh, sanskrit to the japanese of course it was a modern structure only the site was ancient but it was down in the earth he must have felt very cold japan is very extremely cold in winter but if you sit in an underground room it's very warm very pleasant even for an indian in december i'm talking of cold in december in japan so my japanese professor chikyo yamamoto who was accompanying me i asked him why did he sit underground he said i don't know why he was sitting underground i said to avoid the cold of december hmm? <coughs> <coughs> the 
Tamils were ruling Champa for 10 centuries. In the 10th century, <coughs> the Arabs started invading the whole Champa territory. And by the 18th, the royal dynasty of Champa was dying out. Cambodia was also dying out, but the Cambodians were intelligent. They took the French protectorate. So Cambodia survived as a state. It survived as a culture. Actually, the whole history of Cambodia was created in the academic rooms of Paris. It was not created in Cambodia. It happened in Cambodia centuries ago, but recreated in the study rooms of the French professors in Paris. Likewise, the whole kingdom of Champa, the whole glory of the Chameleon people, were spoken of in very eloquent terms in Chinese historical texts. Why? That I'll mention. So, uh, you know, the, if they had also accepted the French protectorate, they would have lived on as a state, they would have lived on as a culture, they would have lived on as a religion. Even today there are about 30 to 40,000 people of Champa who are Shaivas and their ritual is Shaiva. <coughs> if you go to Thailand, the royal ceremonies are all conducted in Tamil. The manuscripts are Tamil. They have two or three hundred manuscripts in Tamil. I, I think they have been microfilmed or I am not so sure, the entire collection. So the people who do these worship, the, the Brahminas, they are of Tamil. Now in this Cham country of Champa, they, they, they had a very rich collection of manuscripts. Throughout Asia, the manuscripts written on palm leaves were highly valued. In Champa, the Chinese emperor sent a mission in 600 AD to get Sanskrit manuscripts written on palm leaves. In Chinese, the palm leaf manuscript is called a patra, tad patra, no, no, patra manuscript. Translated as bundled manuscript, grantha, grantha is tying up. So in English, they translate it wrongly, it should be actually a tied manuscript. So they used to get these manuscripts. A military mission was sent to Champa by the Chinese emperor. They took back 1,350 manuscripts from Champa. The highest cachet of Sanskrit manuscripts that ever went to China. The Southern Song Dynasty in China. They always had problem with the North. The North had barbarians, you know, Huna, Shakas, and the <coughs> people coming, the Turks, were invading North China all the time. So the Sung dynasty came to the south. Whenever the king had a problem, he would send a mission to South India to get the Patra manuscripts. And the Chinese history of the Southern Sung dynasty mentions whenever a mission came, sometime the mission was about 350 people. If they traveled by the land route, it had to be a big mission. Otherwise, they would not be able to cross the sands of the what is called the Silk Route today. They, because on the road, they found too many, you know, naughty person, plunderers and so on, who would rob them on the way. So, but the sea route 
they had fewer people so every uh, king uh, rule of the southern sung dynasty which lasted for about 3 centuries came to the south to get the palm leaf manuscripts of south india so you can imagine the immense role that tamil has played in the culturalization of the whole of asia <coughs> cambodia is it cambodia is a <coughs> Cambodia always had connection with the south. I was in city in in Switzerland, I think, in 1951. There was a beautiful, there's a very beautiful town, Lausanne. In the evening, it looks that the whole city is like a Diwali. Beautiful. We were sitting in the house of Professor Regami, who was teaching Buddhism at the University of Lausanne. There was a great Chinese writer. Perhaps you have heard her name, Han Su Yin. Han Su Yin was the girlfriend of Premier Chow Yun Fat of Beijing. So you can imagine what a great writer she was. And you know, when we sat down, she said, "Why are you afraid of saying that you were also conquerors?" I said, "I am not afraid." The whole uh, myth of India being a land of hinsa is created by Mahatma Gandhi. So I asked Han Su Yin a question. that you have about 2500 sanskrit texts translated into chinese for the last 13 centuries you translated 2500 works do they anywhere mention a hinsa she said no i said then you yourself in your buddhist literature have evidence that we were not a people of by a hinsa we fought when necessary and then she gave me an example She gave me the example of Kamdinya. What did Kamdinya do? Kamdinya went to the temple. The goddess told her, "Take a can, a, a boat, bows and arrows, and go to the east. Found a kingdom there. He took a boat, went to the went to Cambodia, defeated the queen. He had better equipment, better weapons, better arrows." and he buried the queen kamdinya and gave her the sanskrit name soma so soma she was wearing only leaves he gave her the sarong in the whole of southeast asia the tamils have given the sarong to the people sarong sarong or you know the special type of dhoti if you see the statues in cambodia and elsewhere they wear a south indian style of dhoti not the north indian style with coming from the back hmm what else did they give they gave them cultivation these people were tribals the tribals had to be given a new civilization and the first thing was giving them a dress giving them a choli hmm famous hindi song choli ke piche kya hai if you remember <laughs> you know and then the chinese annals say that when the indian brahmins came they the tribes used to bring their girls to them in hundreds now the my professor asked me why did they bring them in hundreds i said very simple they gave them dresses instead of leaves they were wearing dresses they were wearing cholis they looked like charming women so they they gave them a charm they gave them agriculture in cambodia we have found agriculture rice fields of the second century ad given by kamdinya now we gave them a script why was the script necessary throughout southeast asia you have the pallava script variants of the pallava script why their small chieftain when they started making kingdoms again an idea given by tamils that have big kingdom because without a large territory territory you can't create a culture or a civilization so gave them the i concept of what a kingdom is and they started the making of these kingdom how to send messages to distant places they needed a script gave them scripts and you know it's very interesting that in indonesia 
the pallava script is following the same development levels as in south india so we can date a indonesian inscription on the basis of a dated inscription from the tamil nadu very interesting that how do we date different historical periods there are various criteria of dating not only one but this is one of the factors what else did they give them they gave them <coughs> the concept of uh, <coughs> you know um, what shall i call it <coughs> of uh, <coughs> cre- cre- you know a, a, a democratic idea that the king is meant for the people in kalidasa's words prakriti ranjana and vartha raj shabdo why is a king called a raja because he please keeps his people happy happiness of the people is the criterion of a great king prakriti ranjana pleasing the people the king really becomes a raja raja so they gave this whole idea the chieftain was not there to kill the people to rob them to take the things away but to make them happy so the happiness of the people a very important concept and you know his majesty the king of bhutan has called it gross national happiness in the ashokan inscriptions it is called hita sukha hita is what the thing king thinks is useful for the people but sukha is what the people feel about that for example we had the elections in gujarat they have raised questions they raise questions about demonetization and so on hmm so the whole idea of the happiness of the people the gross national happiness was a gift of the tamil people so the whole culture of south east asia beginning with the dresses beginning with agriculture beginning with the state beginning with the relationship of the state and the people the thought system the great thought systems created the great architecture created architecture was always public you see the king lived in it trans he lived in an ephemeral building he lived in a building made of timber but the temples were always made of blasting stone the king was the passing of time but the temple was the eternity of time so please don't forget this difference that throughout south east asia no palace has survived only temples have lived because they were made of stone hmm? i think i have spoken to you now but i would just like to say one thing that your greatness brings me here but i at the same time wish the question of jerusalem <coughs> shining jerusalem you created the jerusalem you gave it gold you gave it clothes you gave it uh, uh, culture everything you gave it even vegetarianism on a holy day not every day on only on friday and a very pure vegetarianism we have once again to think that what can tamil nadu do to project this great image of india which they created in the past not for a day or two but for centuries because the tamils were excavating in gold in africa the gold mining there is very similar to the gold mining in south india of the first century and above all they have found tamarind in those places tamarind doesn't exist in africa makes it a very final assessment that they were tamils who were excavating these gold mines so this is the gold suvarna bhumi of india please make it the suvarna bhumi once again thank you well as i said professor chandra certainly did not disappoint uh I want to thank you for this uh, exploration of history really much like unfolding a mystery in many ways but speaking about the greatness of this part of the world and how it has spread 
and has not really been recognized. So once again, thank you, Professor Chandra. And we have a gift for you here. So thank you one and all. This concludes this session.